Jerusalem. You may be seated. Welcome to Grace this morning. It's great to see you all. Uh, it is getting close to Christmas. You can tell that feeling is, uh, is sort of hitting us, I, I believe. To those of you who are watching us online, we want to welcome you as well. Uh, we pray that you are blessed by this morning's service. As we begin uh, this service today, the third Sunday of Advent, I would like to welcome and uh, call up Damon and Sheila to light the third Advent candle. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is the third Sunday of Advent. Today we relight the candles of hope and preparation, and we are also going to light the candle of joy. The scripture reading, the scripture reading comes from Luke 2, 25 to 32. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout, he was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. We light this candle of joy, just as Simeon praised God for the coming of the Lord, the Christ, we also come to God with a deep joy. He has sent us Jesus, who is the hope of our world, whom we prepare our hearts for, and who is our joy as we wait for his coming again. Thank you very much, Damon. Sheila, thank you. Would you join me in a word of prayer as we begin our time together? Father, this morning we have come together, and, uh, we come together with expectancy, Lord, that uh, you are here in our midst. Thank you for the reminder already, as we have listened to your word, as the Advent candle has been lit, and as we remember, and as we anticipate you, we anticipate your return. But today, Father, we also, we anticipate uh, your word to us, what you would have for us, Father. Prepare our hearts, Father, so that there is nothing that draws our attention away, but instead, Father, help us to be focused upon you, not on the things around us, but upon you and, and your word to us. Open our hearts, open our minds to receive you this day. In Jesus' name, amen. I believe the choir is now going to lead us as, uh, as we sing together.
please be seated. Sorry about that. Sorry to those online as well who got a ear full of scritchy scratching. <laughs> but uh, let's come together and pray. Heavenly Father, we continue in our season of waiting. Continue to shape us during this time, just as you shaped your people Israel as they waited in the wilderness. But shape us, Lord, that we would be more ready to serve you, ready to love you more, and ready to love others. God, forgive us for the ways that we shirk the joy and privilege of serving, for the excuses that we find uh, and the excuses that we make. Forgive us for the ways that we fail to love you in responding to your still small voice in our lives. Lord, you urge us to do certain things. You encourage us in other ways, even through the voice of others that you send our way, through the hands and feet of others, uh, other brothers and sisters in Christ in our lives. And yet, we fail to respond to you. Forgive us for that. Forgive us also for the ways that we have failed to love others. Lord, your love for your creation is vast. It's, uh, it's unending. It's full of grace. It's full of mercy. And you call us to do the same. And yet, we're so fickle, and we withhold these things from others. And Lord, that's not your way. And so, God, forgive us for the ways that we have held that to, our, to ourselves, held your, loves, your love only for ourselves, only for those that we deem worthy, when really you hold the whole world with your open arms. God, we have failed you in different ways this week. Uh, you know, Lord, we, here we uh, confess these things uh, as a community, but Lord, individually, uh, we have failed and fallen short as well. And so we just want to spend a moment before you with those things, those struggles, those sins that uh, we are remembering from this past week, and we want to give them up to you now. Lord, thank you that you hear us. And because we are forgiven through Jesus Christ, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. And we come before you with great joy, and we're so grateful, God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I'll just call Dan up, uh, who will be leading the family time. So kids, why don't you come on forward at this time? Guys, nice to see you all. Any left? Yes, we do. We have some more feet running up. Perfect. Sparkly. Oh, and one who just thought better and left. Okay. <laughs> okay. I know the feeling sometimes. That's cool. All right. It's going to be real quick because I can't sing, but I'm going to try something. Do you guys know the song Santa Claus is Coming to Town? Do you know that line, he's making a list, checking a twice one, that one? Okay. Can we sing that right now? I forget all the words. Oh, okay. If you know it, sing it. You too. He's making a list. He's checking it twice. He's going to find out who's naughty or nice. Santa Claus is coming to town. That's enough. That's enough. I just want to talk to you for just two seconds about the line. He's making a list, checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty or nice. Would not be amazing if there was no list. And, and if there was a list, that the list of all the naughty things that we do could go away. Would that be good? Would that be kind of nice? Do you think it would be nice if there's no list? I think it's amazing there'd be no list. And, 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 and there is a way for that list to go away, and that's because Jesus, who we're celebrating right now, who was born, he was born so that one day he could take away the list for us, the list of our sins. That's what I think naughty is all about, the sins in our life. And Jesus took it away when he went to the cross. So, so good old Santa's keeping track of things, but he really doesn't have to. 
because Jesus took it away from us. But he can only take it from us when we believe in him, when we confess what we've done that's naughty. Then he takes it away. And there's another part. We need to, we need to be committed to not do those things again and again. But the good, good, great news is that he'll take it away every time we confess. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for the fact that you don't keep lists. For those of us who call to you as our Lord and Savior, that there is no list. You welcome us as your children. And so, Father, uh, my prayer this morning for these children is that they will know that they are welcome and that they will know that their God loves them and that they will know that all they need to do, Father, is to turn to you and to pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thank you, Dan. See you, kids. As the kids are heading up, I'll just give some announcements for this week. Uh, so the first one is that if you'd like to re continue receiving offering envelopes, please get in touch with Cheryl by December 29th. Or you can also sign up uh, right by the nativity scene out in the foyer. Uh, there's one of our uh, tables there, cocktail tables. And uh, on there is also a um, uh, sign-up sheet as well. And so you can get in contact with Cheryl or you can sign up on that sign-up sheet uh, if you'd like to re continue to receive envelopes. Uh, know that you'll continue to have the same offering envelope number as you've always had. Uh, otherwise, you can just write your name print and print it out neatly, and uh, we have it in the system as well. Uh, also wanted to let you know that end-of-year donations will be taken with checks post-dated for December 31st. Uh, if you're not able to be here, but also just to uh, remind you that uh, indeed that uh, the end of the year, New Year's Eve, is on a Sunday as well. And so we do want to uh, thank you for your donations and for your offering this past year and as you uh, consider um, your end of year donations as well. <clears throat> also wanted to let you know, again, to save the date for the 12 days of Christmas that we're going to be celebrating together on Saturday, January 6th at 6.30 p.m., uh, I think I saw Marianne posting some things downstairs, uh, just down on the uh, lower landing as you leave the sanctuary and you head down. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet there. Uh, and so we do need some uh, musicians and singers. I believe that we need uh, three kings. We need a good King Wenceslas, and we also need a page as well. Uh, so it's going to be a really, really fun night, and we're uh, hosting it here in the Grace Living Room. And so if you want to know what does, what, what does that mean, I'm curious too. It's going to be fantastic. And so come on out for that. Uh, it is a potluck um, for, for uh, snacks and desserts. So eat your dinner and then bring something to share. And it'll be a great, great time. Uh, the last one, I just wanted to make eye contact with Mike Mango. So is there soup left from, from no soup left? All right. So if you missed it, you missed it. So sorry. But uh, when we have it again, so we um, support the raw carrot uh, and more you know, it's, it's supporting them, but it's also just enjoying the soup that they're able to make for us. And so the next round, be sure to uh, order your soups in for that. Let's continue in worship from hearing from our choir, uh, Calypso Lullaby. <clears throat>
lovely. Uh, so we're going to be turning to our scripture reading. So it's from two places in Ezra. Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, and Ezra chapter 3, verses 10 to 13. So Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. In the first year of King Cyrus, uh, Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put it in writing. Oh, sorry. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. And in my lo any locality where survivors may be live now be living, the people are to provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. And skipping over to Ezra chapter 3, verses 10 to 13. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with trumpets, and the Levite, the son of Asaph, uh, with symbols, took their place to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, He is good. His love toward Israel endures forever. And all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping, because the people made so much noise, and the sound was heard far away. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks. We give you thanks that you are a God who restores us, a God who frees us, a God who calls us back into right relationship with yourself, Lord, through your son, Jesus Christ. And we celebrate that today. But God, many of us come with heavy hearts. Many of us come from weeks that have been uh, weary and anxiety-inducing. And, uh, and maybe some of us have just had really good weeks as well. But Lord, in all these circumstances, from one end of the spectrum to the other, emotionally, Lord, we just want to hear from you this morning. We want to ask that your spirit would break through any of the distractions, anything else that would keep us from hearing your voice. And we ask that you would speak to us and that our hearts would be open and ready to, to hear what it is that you have for us this morning. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, may they be pleasing and acceptable to you, God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Ah. So, when something we own gets older and gets broken down with time, if it holds value to us, we may try to restore it. Here's a picture of my mom and dad that I love because it really, it's, it's the perfect picture of who they are. You can't see it there. Uh, the picture has been fading with time, but I love it because it captures their personality. My dad is the flamboyant one. He's very gregarious, he's outgoing, he's very easy to get to know. And then my mom, you can't see it there, but she's very buttoned up. And she's, uh, she's got her hands in her lap, and it's, everything's very interior. And that's, that, those are my parents. Like that's, that, it, The picture is there perfectly. And so recently I fiddled around with it because it's disappointing to me. This, this picture's on my uh, table if you ever want to take a, a closer look at it. But it's in my table in my office. And I love it because, uh, well, because I love them, but, but I was fiddling around with it to try to restore it a little bit, and I think I, it's not great, <laughs> but, but the, the heart was there because I want to restore it. I was fiddling around with it so I could see just the picture a little bit better. And you can see my mom a little bit outlined a bit better in the, in the next one. But I, it holds great value to me, this photo of them. I remember when I first stumbled across it as a teenager. I was in their room as you know, kids do, or as I do, because I'm so nosy. And I was just in their shelves and looking at their photo albums, and I took one down. And I remember turning the page to this, I was like, oh my gosh, this is perfect, I love this. And so I told them, like, mom, dad, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this photo. And they're like, well, I mean, if you want. And I was like, yeah, I wanna, I, I love it. So I've, I've had it on me 
you know, through university and things like that uh, since then. You know, to you, you might have that thing that you want to restore, that thing that you really, really love. It might be a piece of artwork or it might be a piece of clothing that, you know, if you put in that love and care, you might be able to, to mend it. Perhaps for others who are more mechanically inclined, you might have a vehicle that you've been working on, or maybe it's just something that, uh, uh, that you remember. Maybe it's not the exact vehicle, or perhaps it's something else. But today we're going to look at the restoration of God's people to their land, but not just to the land, but the temple's restoration as well. The temple was ruined when the people were exiled. So the Babylonians took all the beautiful tools that were used to serve the Lord in worship, and then they destroyed the temple. They burned it. And we can read about that in 2 Kings chapter 25, verse 9, verses 8 and 9. It's so depressing. I mean, generation after generation of Israelites, they were brought into their promised land, and they were told, you know, if you follow the Lord, all will be well with you, but if you don't, then you will be led into exile. And they were told this, and they were given multiple messages and multiple prophets, and they just, they just didn't. And so at the end of 2 Kings, it, it gets to this point. On the seventh day of the fifth month, in the 19th year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, commander of the imperial guard and official of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He set fire to the temple of the Lord, the royal palace, and all the houses of Jerusalem. You know, and it's, it's sad because the temple had lost its meaning, though, even before then. And so you read about this, and you read about how this general just lays waste to the temple. But the temple had lost its meaning even before. The sadness of that idea of the place where God dwells, it laid empty even before that. The Lord had vacated it which meant that their true king, their spiritual father, their spiritual king had left his throne room. He had vacated it. And the prophet Ezekiel, if you read, it, uh, if you read in verse, uh, chapters 9 and 10, you read how the Lord abandoned the temple because of his displeasure with the, Lord, with the, with the peoples of disobedience. You see, the spirit of the Lord, it, it leaves the inner sanctum, the inner place where the holiest of holies and where the Ark of the Covenant lay. And that Ark of the Covenant... You know, it's more than just something that houses the Ten Commandments and other items in there. It was actually the footstool of God. Like, so if you think of a throne, and you think of the footstool, so here's God, lofty and high, lifted up, but he dwelt right amongst his people. And in Ezekiel, there's this vision of how the Spirit of God starts to depart in stages. In verse 9, uh, chapter 9, he leaves and he's at the threshold of the temple. In chapter 10, he moves further along until he leaves altogether. The Lord had abandoned the temple because of his displeasure with the people's disobedience. His people's disobedience and rebellion caused the relational fracture. So forget about politics. Forget about, you know, uh, their standing amongst uh, all the other nations of the world, their wealth and their empire that they were trying to build, any of that. It all comes down to the relational fracture between a God and his people the people that he loved unconditionally. The Lord had provided everything, but their hearts were not his. And it's in the Old Testament that we see see our own journey, isn't it? Our hearts are forever wandering, just like the hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. It reminds us in the second verse, which I love, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. When you read the Old Testament, you see the movement and you see the disappointment of the way that the people of Israel were, that's us. Individually and collectively, we have our good days where we're with God and we feel like, yes, I am right in God's hand, I'm obeying him. And then there are a lot of times where you realize, wow, you know, I've been completely off track and God is bringing me back. How does God react to this, though, to this feeling of prone to wander, prone to leave the God I love just as the people did? Well, last week we heard about how the Israelites were in captivity, they're exiled. But then we heard how even in the midst of judgment that they fully deserved, they're given proclamations of hope. During the last parts of their predetermined exile, God gave them a message that they would surely be set free. And so his message to them was one of comfort. Comfort, comfort my people. And in response, they were to prepare the way of the Lord 
They were to remember his promises and they were to remember the nature of who their God is, of the character of God. And in this way, the message of comfort would stick. It would, it would be you know, enmeshed in their lives and they could really live it up. But for our message today, let's take a look at how we see our God as the God who restores and what spiritual reality this gives to us as we wait during a time that can be dark, during a time that can be anxiety-inducing, and just generally troubling. What are we supposed to do? How do we take this spirit, uh, this message of restoration for us? One of the things that we see here in the very first chapter, uh, in our first reading, God kept his promise. That's what we have to remember. God kept his promise. How? The Lord sent Cyrus to free his people. Cyrus the king is mentioned by name in the first chapter. And it also mentions that this is the prophecy that Jeremiah made. Well, not only Jeremiah, but also Isaiah made this prophecy as well. But we'll get to that. So before, we have to do a little quick history lesson. I know we, we've been talking a lot of Israel's history, but you have to get the feel and the scope of the history to understand how amazing it is at this moment in this, in this narrative that God was restoring them. Before Cyrus and the Persian Empire, there was Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire that swallowed everyone up and all the nations were assimilated. That was their religious practice. That was their policy, their foreign policy, if you will, towards the other nations. We've defeated you, and now you've become one of us. You don't have an individuality anymore. You're not your own culture anymore. You are now Babylonian as well. And so if you remember in uh, the, uh, the book of Daniel, you remember that these four young men were snatched out of their land. They were very promising youth. And they're snatched out of their land, and they're completely broken down, and they're, they're being taught how to be completely Babylonian. You don't have your God to follow anymore. You're going to follow our gods. You don't have a specific diet of your own. You're going to eat our food. You're going to do all these different things. But at separate times, they had to stand up for their faith in Yahweh and the Lord. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego... For their allegiance to God, what happened to them? They're thrown into an open furnace as a consequence of their faith in the one true God. In Daniel 3. And this reveals the Babylonian Empire's policy on religion. Oh, you want to defy me and follow your own God? You don't want to bow down to my God? Well, then into the flames you go. But they were miraculously saved. And so here's this way of the Babylonian Empire's policy. It was a way of maintaining power via uniformity we're going to keep everyone on lock and in this way we keep our empire united but cyrus had a different idea he had a different policy so cyrus came up he's from a different empire the persian empire has now been rising the babylonian empire has now been dwindling you know uh, nebuchadnezzar's son was a little bit of a, a little bit of a moron <laughs> and he kind of ran the empire into the ground and then cyrus rises up and it was actually his ideas his policy was codified and is written on this cylinder this cylinder was discovered in 1879 and it presented an amazing about face on the empire that he had just conquered and so for cyrus his foreign policy his idea was to allow people their national identity again, but they would belong to the Persian Empire, though. In fact, if you look at a translation of what is on this scroll, you can see it online. But in his estimation, the ruin of Babylon was because of their god Marduk was displeased with the enforced cease of worship from the other gods. And so he was reversing that policy. He was convicted and said, this is why your empire was beaten by mind. It's because Marduk was displeased with you. And it's because of this enforced lack of worship of the other gods. And so he's saying, all in, inclusivity. You know, it's, you know as, as much as people change, you know, don't you see that in the world today? You see both ends of the spectrum. <laughs> you see one where they say, no, we're all going to believe in the same thing. You see that in, in, uh, within the uh, confines of communism. Or you see this other one, inclusivity, but inclusivity at what cost? Inclusivity meaning some things are, are left out. But what we see with eyes of faith is not just, oh, he had a different foreign policy and he had these uh, revision, revisionist ideas that were amazing and what a, 
What, a, what an incredible figure of history. He is that, but with eyes of faith, we remember that this Cyrus was prophesied about in Isaiah in chapter 44, verse 18 and verse 24. This is what Isaiah said. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord, the maker of all things, who stretches out the heavens, who spreads out the earth by myself, who says of Cyrus, this is my shepherd and will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt and of the temple, let its foundations be laid. A hundred years or so before Cyrus was even born, before he took over, this was God's prophecy. This was God's message to his people. It was to say, this man is coming and I'll take care of you. Or yet again, in the, uh, in the next, in 45 verse 1, he says, this is what the Lord says to, anoint, to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of, to subdue nations before him, to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that the gates will not be shut. You know, God names him by name to allow people to hope. Now, there's a scholarly line of thinking that these are later editions of the text and they're not actually prophetic in the sense of God revealing this beforehand, that this was kind of an added thing after. It happened and then the community of faith added this message so that it would encourage the people. But this is an issue of worldview. Do we believe in a purely naturalistic view of the world where God does not interfere and does not or is not able to affect miracles? Science can help us observe and study things from natural causes. It's a good thing. But just because it comes with this type of presupposition doesn't mean that it then proves that there can't be any other causes. That's just precluding the existence and work of God. And it becomes a circular argument. This is a quote here. But if science, by its nature, can't discern or test for supernatural causes, then those causes can't exist. That's the, that's the argument. So because supernatural causes don't exist, the argument goes, then science rules and we have to observe everything via naturalistic causes and there is no God, there are no miracles because there's no such thing. Alvin Plantinga, a Christian philosopher, responded by saying that this argument is like the drunk who insisted on looking for his lost car keys only under the street light on the grounds that the light was better there. This argument would go the drunk one better. It would insist that because the keys would be hard to find in the dark, they must be under the light. You know, this is that idea when you, this, when you totally just say there is no such thing as miracles. There's only this, what we can see and observe, and you've already chosen your worldview. But what we see in Scripture is we see this message of hope. We see these clear pictures, these clear prophecies of naming who Cyrus is. Let me give you a modern example. And this happened with Reverend Briard. I've shared this story, but I'm going to share it with a little bit more detail. Reverend Briard, he was going through a tough time. Uh, he was ministering here. He was going through a little bit of a tough spell. Uh, I would say that he was even a little bit depressed. And during that time, he had enrolled into a program at Fuller Seminary in California. And so he was uh, to spend a week there in studies. And he had a moment here where just things were very dark for him. And he flew down to California at that time because as those of you who know, Reverend Briard was a, a, a minister here at our church, a very wonderful man, uh, someone that was very influential here that God used to great effect. But as many of you who did know him, he's also someone who just kind of, you can tell, like he just plows ahead. Oh, I'm not feeling good. I'm just going to put my head down and work harder. <laughs> like he's that type of man. I only got to know him a little bit, but he shared this with me. And he went down to California and he's in a very dark spell and he wasn't feeling great. And the professor of that class that he was supposed to be taking that day, he had received a call from a friend of his who is very deeply uh, prayerful woman who lived out in Texas. And as she was praying in Texas that morning, before the class started, she had received a word from the Lord. And the word was, there's a minister, his name is Everett. And he's going through a tough time. 
and you need to pray for him. And so she calls up her friend. She said, look, this is weird, but I have a name for you. There's a minister. His name is Everett. He's going through a tough time. You need to pray for him. I mean, it's documented in a book. I could, I could give you the title of the book, and you could look at it, but this is what happened. Everett's name on God's heart, like it gives me shivers. It makes me want to cry a little bit, but this is how much God cares for us, that he gives Everett's by name from Texas, and then she calls the professor at Fuller that morning to say, you need to pray for him, and he says in that morning, he's like, okay, class, this is weird. A friend of mine in Texas gave me a name that we're supposed to pray for. Is there an Everett here? And everyone's like, well, that's me. And he came up and he got prayed for and he said, in that moment, it's like the darkness was dispelled. And he was able to go forward and he was able to continue. God does these things. He's able to do these things. In scripture, it is written for us. Cyrus, over 100 years before, he's fulfilling that very promise that God had made to his people. I'm going to send them to you. He's going to shepherd you. He's going to get you out of there. You're going to go back to your land. Can you imagine how much of a miracle this would be to the exiles who worshipped in private, who had laid down their roots, who had spent 70 years perhaps seeing some of their friends die off, seeing new families crop up, maybe seeing some of their grandkids and they've lost their language, they don't know how to speak Hebrew anymore, and all these things, and all of a sudden, Cyrus comes on, and then here is this scroll that is written, and he says, no, everyone can go back. God keeps his promises, but not only that, he does it abundantly. Because if you look at the first chapter and you look at verse 4, I mean, this is incredible too. He says, and the people of any place where survivors may now be living are to provide him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. So they are allowed to leave from your midst, and by the way, you better give them these gifts as they go. There is an abundance that God gives us. Not only does he keep his promises, but he blesses us. God is a keeper of his promises. He promised to restore them, and he did, and then some. But there's an ache amongst the excitement. The people had a sense of the now and the not yet. They're given this, they're living it out, and this is what we see in chapter 3, verses 10 to 13. The people were able to praise God for his provision and protection. They have done this monumental thing where God then says to them, rebuild the temple. The priests were ready for doing their duties, and the altar was actually rebuilt first. They observed the Feast of Tabernacles. This is what you see earlier in chapter 3 in verses 2 to 6. They observed the Feast of Tabernacles. They had reestablished the sacrificial system. All these things were in place. They secured the lumber needed. The workers needed to work the lumber. This is in chapter 3, verse 7. And so all is set, and then the thing that they do next is they set the foundation for the next temple, the one that had been burned to the ground. They are ready to rebuild it. Everyone could see what this temple would look like, the footprint of what it would be. God has kept his promises to them, and now they're seeing the fruit of it in their own eyes. They're praising God for it. They're singing a psalm to God that they know well. It's repeated in Psalm 107. In 118, verse 1, it's recorded in 1 Chronicles chapter 16. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. This is, the, this is the song that they're crying out. It's repeated again in Psalm 138, verse 8. The Lord will vindicate me. Your love, Lord, endures forever. It's this idea that God's love is steadfast. It endures. And so they're able to praise him because of his restoration of them. But in this context, you see that there were those who knew what they had lost, and they mourned it. Look at verse 12. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple, they wept aloud because they know what had been lost. For us, it's not that we know what we've lost, but we know what we're supposed to look like and how far we still need to go. God is a God of restoration, but he's also a God who places in us that 
understanding that it's a now and not yet, the things that we yearn for, that we are desiring, that we are living in something identified that is given to us now, but we're not yet in hold of it completely. They're given this temple that is amazing. They're able to rebuild it, but it's not like the one before. But what they're really waiting for is the permanent temple to come, the one that God places in each of our hearts. We're living in this now and not yet still. We're, we're already sanctified in Christ. We see that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, but we're not yet sanctified. We haven't yet reached it. And so we're viewed in two ways. In Jesus, we're completely holy. And yet, the process of becoming holy is a daily step-by-step thing. When God looks at us, the reason that we're already holy is because he sees us in Christ. By putting our faith in Christ, he says, yes, you are declared righteous in Jesus. And so that's why we're allowed to be in right relationship with him. That's why we're allowed to be in his presence And yet, there's still the process of how he's shaping us, how he's continuing to sand off those edges and reshape our hearts and transform us. And so there's a not yet that has taken place. We're already with Christ. He sees us already with him. We're already in that time because eternity has already started now for us. But it's not yet because we're not experiencing it there. We're not with him right now as of this very moment. It's this in-between time that we're living in that's the difficult part. (coughs) And so from our text, even as great as the circumstance this new temple was, this was still a foreshadowing of the greatest restoration. The work of the Spirit in each individual person to build this new community. Through the coming of Jesus the first time, each of us are given this opportunity to to hear his call on us, to put our faith in in what Jesus has accomplished for us. We are not under the ultimate consequence of sin. We're not eternally separated, but we have put our faith in Jesus, then we are with him. The relationship with our creator that we need is restored, and our life is put back together in its right order. But in the here and now, we may look at this half-finished work of the Spirit in our lives, and just like the ancient Israelites, our joy is mixed, is tinged with sadness because we know what a life fully in obedience of the Lord Jesus should look like. But we see just a glimpse of what true glory awaits. Even when we have our hearts broken by the church, whether it's been here or at another church, that too is a picture of joy mixed with pain because we know what it's supposed to look like, but we're not there yet. In each community, in each individual, we're not there yet, but take hope because God is the God of restoration. God is the one who frees us. God is the one who makes us new. He leads us forward. It is for God to do, and he has started it through his son, Jesus. And he has provided the only way for our broken lives to be mended and made into something brand new. It's it's his work. It's what he does. For those of you searching, take this Advent season. It's a season of waiting where Jesus is coming again and know that all our broken lives are made whole when we put our faith in Christ, trusting him wholly, give him your whole life and see how good God's restoration is for all of us and can be for you. Let me suggest a few more things for us to do. I know we have lots of stuff to do already in this season, but this is good. Let's move away from the, I have to read my Bible or else type of thinking to this type. I need to spend time, some time with the Lord today. The shift is to relationship and the growing desire to hear from God to instill hope in us day to day. Believe that God is not far off and aloof, but nearby and wanting to speak to us if we would have ears that are open to listening. God will speak to you through his word. Find time when you don't have to rush. It's hard. You know, you start to quiet down and all of a sudden our minds are like a barrel of monkeys. It's difficult, but find that time where you don't where you aren't under that time crunch. And just one last thing is, get more acquainted with the promises of what God, uh, of God that he makes to us. You know, I was just doing a little quick search. This one website, in just the New Testament alone, records 750 promises in the New Testament for us. 750. 
you know, some of those might be principles rather than promises, but I mean, that's, that's a good word to us. And if we would spend time in them, think about them, enjoying them, wrestling with them, that those promises are for us and what he's able to do in us, for us, that's a good thing that instills hope in us. That instills and helps us to remember that the God who promised Cyrus to his people and who fulfilled it, he will fulfill these promises to us as well. You know, again, I'm, at the beginning, I mentioned the old hymn that we are prone to wander, but it doesn't end there. Because the second line is the hymn's request is our request because it is only God who can do it. But here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. You know, it's, we offer to God our very lives, everything in our hearts, everything in us, that God would take it and that he would keep it for himself. That he would take these hearts that are prone to wander and he would help us to lock in on what we have waiting for us. So God, give us hearts that are only for you, Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and um, Lord, in this in-between time, we try to remember, we try to coax ourselves into being encouraged that you are the God who restores us. But Lord, you know that our hearts are prone to go all over the place, to seek other things. And yet, Lord, as we see in our text today, help us to take great comfort, great encouragement that you are God who always keeps your promises. You are God who restores us, who sets us free. And in setting us free, Lord, Lord, we are in that time of waiting. And Lord, we're impatient with you, we're impatient with ourselves. And we can uh, easily flog ourselves. We forget that there is also grace and that there is mercy at your feet. But God, we also yearn just to be before you. We yearn for that day where, you know, those things that we struggle with will cease to taint our lives and cease to, to pull us off track. But God, we thank you that we have this future vision. Just as you restored the uh, enabled the people to restore the temple, Lord, we have this future vision of, of what it will be like when we are in your presence forever. And that is the time we are waiting for. And we thank you for this good news that you place before us, this hope that you place before us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And let's continue to pray as we pray for our people and our church <clears throat> and as we pray for our world. Lord, in this time where we remember your peace, that you are the Prince of Peace, God, we remember that there are places that are in deep war and conflict, and so, God, we ask for your Spirit to work in those places. It seems so beyond us and way too big for us, and it is. And so, God, we beseech you, we, we lay it at your feet, knowing that you hear us and knowing that you want it as well. And we, play, we pray that you would work it out according to your will. Father, we also want to pray for our church that you would continue to revive us, renew us, transform us, God. Deliver us from the evil one, we pray. For each and every one of us, for our worshiping uh, community here, for our church here, and also other churches around us, and also for our denomination, God, we pray this. Father, we want to pray for healing for our uh, beloved church members. Some of these names we don't know, but we still lift them up to you, God. We pray for Trinity and we pray for Sinead. We pray for the Weathers family. God, we've been praying for a helmet, and we've received news that he'll be seeing the Lord as Savior soon. And we pray, Lord, that uh, for his family and for his wife, Marilyn. And God, we pray for Liz. We pray for Nora. We continue to pray for Hisham, the young man who was shot and who's unable to walk. God, we pray for healing in his life as well. There are others' names, Lord, in our hearts, in our uh, people in our lives. We lift them up to you. We thank you that you hear us and that you love them. And let's continue to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. You can see it on the screen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's respond to the Lord by giving back to him a portion of all that he has given to us as we seek to give to the ministry of our church and to serve our world in mission. Uh, and so I just want to uh, invite the ushers forward. <coughs> Thank you, gentlemen. And as the uh, ushers come around, let's sing together, Joy to the World. Let's stand together as you're able. Let's pray. God, may you continue to help us to give joyfully because we want to entrust our whole lives to you and remember that you've given your all to us and so we want to give our all to you. Use these generous gifts from your people, Lord, to grow your kingdom. Help us to serve this neighborhood faithfully with grace and with truth. Give us wisdom in our use of these good gifts, we pray. Amen. Now, as we are sent into our world and into our neighborhood and into our families as we uh, talk to our loved ones. Take this blessing with you now to him who is to, able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen.